in this modern world, is there always going to be this difficult side to anything that you're not going to want to do? Like if you're a painter, is there going to be a side where you're not going to want to be selling or setting up aisles or uh, setting up shows? Like, I guess it's just a part of it that you got to grapple with and somehow get through. What do you think? It's what Mark Manson talks about. He says that whatever it is that you end up doing, no matter how much you love it, there's always going to be a shit sandwich that you have to eat. And the shit sandwich is just the parts of the thing that you don't love. And you want to find a profession, a vocation, a lifestyle where you don't mind that flavor of shit sandwich as much as other people do. Right. Pick your shit sandwich. Yeah, this it gets annoying. There's a lot to learn. Like I'm trying to learn editing right now and just computer stuff. It always has to do with softwares and computers and it's just the files like, that are inside the computer. Files. <laughs> trying to get the files that are in the computer out of the computer. I don't know how to do it. Are they really in there? But yeah, it gets it gets a little frustrating, but it's really means nothing. And this is actually a good avenue to go down. I was listening to Robert Green on he did a new diary of a CEO that's Sneed mm. and Bartlett. Robert Green has you may or may not know is our favorite human being. He's one of our legends. Favorites. One of uh, he's, he's, I think he's my favorite human being. No, it's a, it's a tall order. But he just talks about Stephen Bartlett asks him. So I'm reading right now, The Laws of Human Nature by Robert Greene. And they're kind of discussing some of these laws. And Robert Greene a few years ago had a stroke, nearly died. And what I like about him a lot is that he really discusses just ex uh, appreciating the mundane beauty of life that we so often take for granted. And like he, after a stroke, he watched people in the park just sitting on a bench. And he's like, if only you knew how lucky you are to be able to sit there and not worry, you know, obviously you worry about different things, but to not have had a stroke, like you can do that. You could go for a swim, you could go for a hike. And that hits me hard because I feel the same way a lot of the times with my back. I'm like, if only you knew, like you don't want to go to the gym. If only you knew how lucky you were to be able to go to the gym and not worry about pain. Because that's all I, you know, that's what I'm striving for. And we'll be back there, but that's why I like him. It just makes me appreciate that I have so much, obviously, besides, you know, a bit of pain. But it's like, it makes me appreciate everything else that I do have. To be young, to be excited about my future, to have something to strive for. We don't realize how good we have it. And obviously that comes in varying degrees, whoever's listening to this, but there's so much that maybe we're struggling right now, but there's so much that we still have that we can appreciate. And on that podcast, Stephen Bartlett asks him, he's like, if I'm 23 or I'm 30, 31 years old, just turned 31. If, um, if, I was Robert Greene. If you were speaking to to you as a 31-year-old, like what would you tell me? What would you tell me to do differently? Robert Greene's like, I never do that um, exercise because I wouldn't change anything. And he says, first of all, he says, he's like, God, I hate you so much. Like you're 31, you're a kid. Like you haven't even, and obviously Stephen Bartlett's like a CEO. He's crushing it. But he's like, you're, you haven't even started. Like you're a kid and you've, so much in front of you and he says i wouldn't change like anything when i was 31 i was just like robert green saying this i was pretty much a shithead like i hadn't even started writing yet i didn't know what to do i was just kind of floundering around nothing necessarily wrong with that but he says i don't wish i changed anything like i don't regret anything i wouldn't change anything because everything led to where i am now I couldn't have written my books, still I'm talking, couldn't have written every book that I wrote if I didn't have those years of not knowing and then one thing led to the next and then it had to happen that way. So I wouldn't change anything, but you just don't realize how good you have it, you know, just to be young and able-bodied and anything, to have a clear mind. So 
these little things like the bring back to us stressing for an hour over my camera crane broke and I'm hearing this little buzzing in my headphone. It's like to be able to do this, we are beyond blessed. Yeah, it makes me think about what we were talking about on the phone the other day that it's crazy to think about that we have found what we want to do with our lives. Like for the longest time we were searching and to various degrees we'll always be searching, but we at least have something. You have writing, I have coaching, I also like to write. There's so many different things that we'll always be doing, but to have a direction is so such a blessing, especially at our age. And it makes me laugh because yeah, there's so much there's so much good and yet the bad, the small things when we're trying to figure out a new software for podcasting and the mics aren't working and all these things. And it's 7.15 at night over here for me because we're trying to make this work with the time change. It's just the little nuances, the little shit sandwiches. But when you zoom out, we are so lucky. We are so lucky to be walking down a path that excites us. I mean, I moved into a new office today, my first office ever. I'm in a little private office right here. And it's so cool. It feels like the next chapter in my coaching business. It feels like the next chapter in my life. And yes, it's late at night and I've been working all day, but I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, I didn't realize it's seven and you're you're still at the office. It's, it's still at the office. Wild. You got an office. Congrats, bud. That is Thanks, fun. man. That's going to be cool. Big, big moment. And I got your piano over here to the right. So you go over there and miss that thing. dance away yeah, on the yeah. ivories. I could, I, I'm thinking about like how that felt. Like when I just moved into my Osaka apartment and it's like still bare. Maybe it has like a bit of the remnants from the last person that lived or worked there. <laughs> like you have a kind of a random painting of like a Viennese village <laughs> it's on the wall. But it's yeah. awesome. Like that is over time, the next six months, it's going to get so much of your character and already is. But these are the like, these are the moments, man. These are the things like we'll look back at this episode and be like, God, remember when you just moved into the office and we struggled for an hour to just get this show going. And then obviously once we start, we're rolling. But like with the last episode just a couple of days ago, it was like a really hard day and managed to do the podcast anyway. It made me feel so good doing it. But I did it because some advice that I'm really trying to implement is comes from both Brendan Backstrom, who's my mentor in this back healing journey, and also from Alex Ramosi, who we quote quite often. But they both just say how important it is to document the hard times as opposed to the the good times. I'll just, Alex Ramosi, first of all, says, here's my advice to my younger self document your life more. Otherwise, you'll forget the details. And the details are what make it worth remembering. Those are the moments that you want to ignore, that you want to look away from that you need to capture. Because those are the moments that you will tell in the future of things you got through. No heroes are heroes without epic monsters. The bigger the monster, the greater the hero. And then, like I was telling, I told, spoke about this in the last podcast, but that morning on Wednesday, a couple of days ago, like I woke up brushing my teeth my back went out (laughs) didn't go out but like i feels like somebody hit me with a sledgehammer like my lower back just like so you gotta be fucking kidding me like this day's shot like what am i gonna do could felt like i could barely get out of bed then had the call it was scheduled for like 30 minutes later with back ability group and made me laugh like brendan's just like (laughs) i've seen this guy like because i told him i was doing elephant walks this week which is my kryptonite it was like the thing that once I get over doing elephant walks, which is like bending over with your hands in front of you, like on a pad and kind of rocking your knees back and forth because it tugs on both like your hamstrings and your back. So like mm. when your back is healthy, it should be able to do that. And you go lower and lower until you could do Jefferson curls, which is like holding weights and then curling back up. And I could not tolerate like any elephant walks right now, but I tried on Tuesday I was okay, did a normal workout Wednesday, tried again Thursday, and that's when just the castle came falling down. 
And Brendan's like, like I've seen Vinny in his highs and his lows, and you gotta just give it to him. Like this guy's going up against David and Goliath. Like he did him Tuesday, felt okay, and then he wasn't feeling great, but did him again on Thursday. Like you gotta just, you gotta be impressed. Like yeah, like seriously, like I pretty much it feels like such a mental game. I'm just like fuck it. Like I'm not gonna be scared of this exercise. Like I'm just gonna try it again. And of course. <laughs> been in the hole for a week and a half from it but you know when it this is what tells there's like these are the clues so i know that's my biggest hurdle is is flexion and it's playing with fire this program it's like you have to keep kind of testing what you could do and just knock on the door instead of trying to barrel through it which i did knock last on week. the door knock like, on the knock door and see who answers listen. yeah exactly and then if it's it's a uh welcoming homeowner <laughs> head on in but anyways and he's i was like i was crying before the call i woke up had tears in my eyes like can't believe this but as i was talking to brendan he's like like that is when i get the camera out like when i'm just like in despair and i don't know how i'm gonna get through it i start recording like you gotta do it because that's what shows once you do get out of it that gives you credibility and that's what shows people like what you got through. And it's, you know, at the end of the day, it's for me to see what I've made it through. But another one from Hormozy. Um, rather than saying, these are the reasons I can't succeed. I think reframing that and saying, these are the reasons that when I succeed it will be an even better story and it'll be more powerful to other people. So like I could say, I can't fucking do this. I can't believe I'm back without again. Like, how am I going to do it? I just can't do it. Being like, no, I know it's going to happen. And when it does, this is the proof that it's going to be an even better story. It's all this to say, document the tough times. Obviously, we have different jobs and maybe you're not into documenting, but I think it's uh, it's worthwhile because it get, makes you think that kind of gets you out of your own head instead of being like this is never going to change it's like okay like Alex Muzzy just said when it does inevitably change I'm documenting this now to show myself the monster that I defeated I think regardless of what you do professionally documenting it is a good thing and you may never share it outwardly you may never share it with other people but to keep track for yourself of your own highs and lows is really helpful. I have a little Excel spreadsheet that I call life highlights. And when big moments happen, like today, I updated it because I moved into this office. I put it down in there. What happened with the date? Just so I can look back, especially when I'm feeling low and just kind of look at all of the highlights and accomplishments that have happened throughout the years. It's super cool because I started doing it in 2022. So I can be like, wow, on that day in 2022, like that's when I got certified with this. And I was so excited. And having pictures too on the camera roll so you can go look. I mean, my first office before this was in my bedroom. And before I had the last setup, it was an even jankier setup, like a sketchy desk and a little chair and nothing on the walls. And I have a picture of that. And then I have a picture of the next iteration. Then I have a picture of when I sent you the podcast studio. I'm using air quotes because it was like two desks pushed together so I could do guest episodes in my room. But then that felt kind of weird and stuffy and it's too hard at the house. And so now I'm here and I'm going to set up a studio in front of me. I'm going to take a picture of it and I'm going to have the life highlights. And I think that's super important. And then bringing it back to Hermosi, I love how he is all about telling the story. Obviously you are too. We have live a story worth telling on our arm, but he said that's what he uses to determine his behavior. He was working with a guy and he told him, if you're ever trying to figure out what would Alex do, just ask yourself what would make the most epic story. And that's the option I'm going to choose. Yeah, it's crazy. And what's cool about that is it pretty much jumps to, it gives you faith in the end, that in the end it's going to work out. Instead of, I could sit here all day and be like, and a lot of times I do, I'm just like, I don't know what the fuck I'm going to do to get out of this. Like, But if you are, it's pretty much saying like, I mean, this just goes back to the quote again, by documenting it and stuff, it's saying that this piece of the puzzle is part of a bigger puzzle it's part of a bigger story this is not the end 
this office that you're in now is not going to be your office forever out there. Like step it's one, just, yeah, this is just a small step in the greater scheme of it all. <laughs> and I mean, that's really cool and helps you get out of the minutia and just the annoying little everyday trivial stuff that we have to do. And just all we're going to remember is the bigger picture of us. This is the day that you moved to the new office. It wasn't the day that we had the little troubles about, you know, getting this show going. It's having that kind of bigger perspective and yeah, it's, it's very encouraging that Robert Greene, he he looks at Stephen Bartlett and he's like, "You are just a kid," and he's thirty one, like crushing it. And to know that, like you were saying, to know what we want and to know what we're excited about, it is a great feeling because no matter what happens, like we're implementing our flawed plan here, like taking incremental steps towards this future that we want. And like yesterday, I was just getting stressed out about. I basically, I was telling you before this that now that I'm looking for a new job and I don't have a job right now, it feels like I have like 20 things to do every day and I'm just like ticking things off a list until I can't do anything else. As opposed to when I was had a job teaching English, I would try to, like I would just work on my book in the morning or work on a story and that was like the one thing I would do besides going to work. So it was like, got that done, felt good. But now I'm kind of swimming in possibility and like trying to create a brand and it's like so much that I feel like I have to do that I'm getting overwhelmed. But to see it as instead of like pretty much just knowing that it's going to work out makes all the stuff just not matter as much. It takes the pressure off so you can actually enjoy this experience. Like this shouldn't be a time of stress and anxiety. Put your faith in higher power, whether that's God or the universe or destiny and believe that things are going to happen as they're meant to. You are in the palm of, you know, the universe's hands. I want to say God. But like, take the pressure off of yourself because it's going to be all right. You're going to get to where you're meant to go. If you got the drive, if you got any inkling or something that's calling to you, walk in the direction, do what you can, work as hard as you can. But all means nothing unless you are enjoying it or just at least appreciating it, seeing it at the bare minimum. Be where you are, basically. Yeah. And speaking of emotions and feeling and all of that, it makes me think of how important it is to not wait until you feel good to take action, but rather to take action and it will change how you feel because I felt terrible 19 minutes ago. And I feel so much better now. We literally just Seriously. started rolling and now idea, ideas, idea, <laughs> I'm drunk, ideas are flowing and I feel yeah. so much better. And we had no idea what we were going to talk about. Now little things are popping into my head, left and right. And one thing that I wanted to share is just the beauty of making mistakes along the way. We were talking about a flawed plan. It made me think about this. I recently created a free guide on how to live a story worth telling. It's this nice little sexy PDF people can sign up for. We'll link it in the show notes. But for the first week that I had this out there and I was running paid ads that was directing people to this. So hundreds of people were seeing this. People were downloading it. Turns out that the guide was totally messed up. The, <laughs> and I'm, I'm going to take ownership for this because I didn't do a high enough quality review, but essentially the graphic designer who created it linked the text boxes in the section. So you go into typing your answers and you start typing in one text box and every single text box on this like eight page guide starts filling up with the same words. So it's absolutely useless. You, you can't use it. The, for the people out there who started using it, we're just like, what, what is, is this guy, did a kindergartner make this? So it's my fault for not catching it. But now just like a week into it, my friend being like, hey, you know, this is broken, right? And I'm just like, oh no, it's just the happy little accidents that are gonna happen along the way when 100%. you're trying to do anything for the first time. For sure. Yeah, take some of the pressure off. Like you you learned something from that, you know? Yeah, and that's all. Quality that control. Quality you control. Read every word, click every button before you send something out. 
I will not make that mistake again. I've definitely done it myself. Yeah, it's... uh, I just watched Theo Vaughn on Joe Rogan. He said the same exact thing. Somebody, some fighter messaged him like, pretty much, don't wait until conditions are perfect to begin. Because it's never going to be perfect. We've talked about that before. The whole speech from Douglas Murray. Yeah. Talking about, you know, in wartime, saying that conditions are never going to be perfect. Like, you go on and you live your life anyway. And, and you change the conditions. Me. You change the conditions. You change the conditions by acting. Like, that's what... Exactly. That's what always gets me. You change the conditions. You can change how you feel. Mm-hmm. 100%. Like, if you wait for the perfect opportunity to start living, to start appreciating, to start doing anything, it's never going to come because conditions are never perfect. It's amazing to see the people who did insane things when conditions weren't perfect. That's pretty much everyone. Like, you, like, how did they do that during this? And something that kind of helped lately a little bit was the Jordan Peterson, when his daughter, Michaela Peterson, was throughout like her whole childhood, she was pretty much just in her boat, her bones were like breaking down and her body was just destroyed for some something. I kind of forget what it is, but really bad. And like, couldn't eat, just pressed it was awful and it could have like brought Jordan Peterson and his wife down like seeing their daughter so hurt but they would schedule like a time and a lot of time every day to worry about it and think about it but then besides that they had to move on because it takes over your entire life now I was going through something emotionally recently that you helped me through and I kind of tried to do this where I was like I can't this is taking over my life and I can't let it do that like I have to a lot, a certain amount of time. Didn't work that well. <laughs> I was seeming to be thinking about staying at all hours, but it's a pretty useful thing to be able to departmentalize your thoughts and be like, this is not serving me whatsoever. I'm not going to think about it. I mean, sometimes that makes you think about it more, but what are your thoughts on that? I have found that the best thing is to think about it really hard and really intense one time and like get the thoughts out get it onto a piece of paper type it out get it out of your head and onto a page and that really really helps otherwise for me if i stay in the oh don't think about it don't think about it it's just this constant loop where i'm trying not to think about it yet yeah and i keep like seeing a corner of it and i start thinking about it a little bit and then i'm like no 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 so the compartmentalization works really well if you know you have an outlet that works for you whether right. it's journaling whether it's making an audio message to yourself. Mm. Yeah, it's true. If you have a sort of a, instead of just like, yeah, getting really dwelling on a problem, if you're, if you're making momentum with something, it's like, okay, we can make a little bit of momentum every day, but this is the only time we're going to worry about this thing. But think about emotions. Have you had any realizations, any new emotions, anything you're working through at the moment? Hmm. Emotionally. What- I think of emotions and what I've been working through and on is my ability to deal with intense emotions. I worked with a therapist for a little bit on this because growing up, everything in my family is kind of just all good all the time. There's not, there was not much space growing up for negative emotions. If anything was negative, it would be brushed aside. We'd kind of just like shove it down. And because of that, I didn't really learn the tools in the skill set to handle big emotions. So when people would get big emotions around me, I would be like, either like, that's too much, go off on your own and figure it out, or it's not that big of a deal. And for anyone who's having big emotions, if you tell them, hey, it's not that big of a deal, that works for some people, other people, it does not work for at all. So that has been my biggest realization is that when people have big emotions, one, you can let them have their big emotions and it doesn't have to involve you. And two, just because they're having that big emotion doesn't mean that they're upset or frustrated with you. It just might be something going on in their world. And sometimes they need space. Sometimes they need to vent. Sometimes they need support. But they don't always need a solution. Mm, for sure. Yeah. Like from the laws of human nature, it's 
it's pretty much saying like everything we think like is the way we're supposed to handle things like do the opposite like with handling people it's a lot of like you tell somebody who's like an emotional state like it's not a big deal or pretty much projecting what you would do in that situation or trying to help them what you think is trying to help like that as somebody who's depressed and you say that like oh look how beautiful life is like come on so much to live for that's going to have the opposite effect and there isn't really a clear answer but it's i think it's just trying to see from other people's point of view as much as possible be like instead of how would i handle this or what would I need? So what might this person with this certain perspective like truly want or need in this moment? Yeah, it's it's an interesting one. If I told yeah, you this story sorry, go ahead, please. cut you off. I'm just finding that like in the last couple of weeks, yeah, journaling, like pen to paper, and this goes back to document the low points. Like I have all you know, my almost six hundred articles on my website and stuff, but like I don't really look back at those. A journal is something that I can look back at in 50 years and be like, wow, I was at a low point. I was in Osaka. I was just in my room putting pen to paper, old school. And that, it does feel good when I, like we were saying, action kind of always helps instead of just dwelling, like taking action, writing a story, doing something, getting the podcast done. If that does make me feel better, but to actually feel like your emotions go through you as you put the pen to the paper, actually writing like that affects me in a different way. And it has been quite helpful. So I do recommend that. When you talked about doing the opposite of what your mind intuitively goes to, have I told you the story? from Hermosi of there can only be one person in the angry boat? I don't think so. So it was like his first job in high school or between years in college and he worked at like a fur factory, like a fur coat factory selling fur coats. And yeah, you remember? I I, I saw him talk about it, but good Yeah, story. so ba basically he has this job, just weird Everybody job selling Tell it. weird job selling fur coats. And he remembers this one time where he was with his manager and this customer came in and she was livid. She was so mad. She was like yelling about something wrong with the coat she had bought. And she's walking up to the counter and Hermosi is standing there as like a high schooler, just terrified. And his manager is facing Hermosi, looks at him, gives him a little smile and a wink. And then the manager turns around and faces the customer and just immediately goes into rage mode. Like he starts <laughs> yelling. He's so frustrated. He's like, I can't believe this happened to you. Whoever sold you this coat, we're going to fire them. We're going to fix everything. We're going to give you all this stuff. And he was so angry that it made the angry customer back completely off. And she was like, oh no, it's actually not that big of a problem. Whatever, whatever, whatever. And so we diffused the situation by getting more angry than she was. And later in the day when they were in the break room or whatever, Hermosi's like, what the heck was that? And the manager turns to him and says, there can only be one person in the angry boat. So it's basically saying if someone's really angry about something, and I've actually seen this play out in other ways. If you're with someone and they're really pissed off about something, if you tell them, oh, don't worry about it, it's not a big deal, that can frustrate them even more. An alternative strategy is to get more angry than they are at the <laughs> thing. And then they'll usually back off and be like, oh, you know, whatever, it was, it was fine. It was fine. And mm -hmm. obviously that's harder to do if you're not an angry person. But it is really funny that that does seem to be a thing that only one person can be in the angry boat. <laughs> that is funny. It kind of it makes sense, like with the laws of human nature. Pretty much at the crux of it all is like flow with the grain instead of against it. Like you think that you're going to resolve by telling this person you shouldn't be mad or whatever, but it's like be on their side and it kind of uses their uh, uses their own anger like against itself because they want somebody to they kind of want to be like no I'm I'm the angry one and no like, what are you talking about I shouldn't be like I should be angry 
but like you're angry they're like hey it's all right <laughs> chill out yeah, yeah. it's interesting but yeah, much in the book much to it but you know the emotions you're working through emotionally that's it it's only only happy all the time over here. <laughs> right now it's a bit of uh sunny san diego exhaustion oh boy yeah you're gonna have to let yeah. soon okay how are you dealing with overwhelm are you getting overwhelmed at all are you feeling pretty tried and true and I was Vinny, when are you going to understand that I'm perfect? <laughs> I never feel anything but perfection. No, dude, of perfection. course I'm dealing with overwhelm. It seems on Mondays, I feel like I either have really good Mondays or I get overwhelmed or I overwhelm myself because I'll be thinking about everything I want to do throughout the week. And kind of like you were talking about earlier, I'll just try and get as much done as I possibly can, like check as many boxes on Monday. And sometimes that leads to me doing a lot and feeling good. Sometimes that leads to me feeling overwhelmed, but I recently felt super overwhelmed. I bought this CRM software that I've been trying to use and it's just so complex and I haven't not known much about something like this in a while. Like I am so inept at figuring out what it means when I have to change DNS files so that the site is connected to my website and doing all this thing. And I'm just, I have no idea what's going on. And so that for sure felt overwhelming. I was like, how am I, how am I going to figure this stuff out? I'm paying for this yeah. expensive software. I don't know where to go. I don't know who to turn to, but I figured it out. They're, they have office hours. I dropped in, talked to someone. I felt so much better. Ah, oh, good. Good. Yeah. Like st stuff like that. I mean, I definitely feel that working on a website for the last 10 years or whatever. Just like back end software stuff can be so annoying. But, and this applies to any problem challenges, it's like take the smallest step that you can and just face that thing instead of looking at the entire Medusa's head at once. Just take down one snake and gain some momentum. It does help. Like with me, we were talking about before this, instead of, you know, having this big list of things I got to do. Maybe it is best to truly limit myself to three, four things a day. Like one, couple, I don't know, logistical things, one creative thing, and one podcast thing. I don't know, something like that. Or I can't do just like 90 things at once. But So oh, there's, there's this yeah. thing called the Ivy Lee method that I do. Ivy Lee was a consultant way back in the day back in the day of Charles Schwab. And this wow. is what I still do. And I'll show you it and you'll see that I kind of cheat. But basically, if you're watching this on video, you write down six priorities for the day. Put it over here. You write down six priorities. So just one through six. Those are the six things that you do. Ideally, you want to put them in order of importance. You don't move on to the next thing until you get the first one done. Supposedly, this is how you're supposed to do it. Right. And six kind of sounds like a lot, but if that's literally the six things that you do that day, it is pretty limiting. And that's why you, I was saying I cheat is I write down the six and then a lot of times I have like a other category next to it because I want to do more Dog. things, but like maybe you could try that six things. That's and pretty good. Six is a lot. Don't do any more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like it. I'm going to do that. Six things a day. It's a productivity tool from way back in the yonder days when do you set the six in the morning ah this is a great conversation to have i always do it the night before for some reason if i do it the morning of it's way worse i'm a huge proponent of planning for the next day the night before i can't remember who says it but the the day really begins the night before it's something about having the distance between doing the task and setting it and I've heard Ali Abdal, who's a productivity YouTuber, talk about it. He has this, I don't know if it's his thing that he created, but it's called Pilot Plane Engineer. And it's three different mindsets to adopt. Pilot is when you are thinking of the strategy. You're figuring out, okay, where are we going to fly the plane? Plane is when you show up the next day and you're the actual plane. You're just there doing the work, flying through the air. And sure. then engineer is at the end of the week 
when you're reflecting, you're looking back, okay, how did it go? What things do we need to fix? What things do we need to tweak? And yeah. essentially, whatever titles you want to give it, having different ways you show up at different times is helpful. And it's really, for me, that's just how my brain works. So long story to say, I always set what I'm going to do the next day, the night before mm. to make sure I wake up with a plan. So you don't wake up and you're like, what am I going to do today? Yeah, that's a good idea. I think maybe I'm going to start just kind of make a list of like everything that I want to do throughout the week. So I feel like if I don't, I kind of forget little things, but then just instead of trying, cause I, I do like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and try to like list everything I'm going to do for the whole week. And then just like another list of like to do's and other but just make the list and then just every day the night before, because it always changes like what I'm going to do every yeah. day. Like if I try to plan it all at once and just every day the night before pop in six. Yeah. I and get... if you do that, you'll know, okay, tomorrow's Friday or tomorrow's Thursday and I need to have this mm -hmm. thing done. So I'm going to move it. Like you get a, it's easier to prioritize than if you just try and plan out the whole week right away. But I really like what you said of it's super helpful for me to just brain dump, like just get yeah. everything out of your head onto a piece of paper. And then yeah. you can decide once it's out there, then you can decide how to sort it, how to prioritize it. But mm. it's it's so relieving. It's cathartic, really, to get it out it of your is. mind. And like I was saying with the journaling, like I have like a physical piece of paper for this too. It's much different than being on a computer where it's like you're limited to be able to like yeah. scratch things out, to you know, feel like you're doing it, have her on the desk. It's very satisfying. It's yeah. great. You got to have a good pen too. Got a great pen. Whatever leave house with that good pen. What it's is true. uh, what is it? Kevin Kelly says, if you're ever, if you ever find yourself looking for the good fork or the good knife, it means that you have forks and knives that are bad. Like just get the best of everything so that you only have a good thing. So like if you're ever noticing you have a bad pen, you're screwing up. Just find the find the pen you like and just buy it. The same one over and over again. It's true. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I had a couple days ago put on my socks. I'm like, I got a I got a hole in my sock. I got one that I'm wearing right now. I'm like, this is throw it out. I don't want bad socks. I want all good socks. And it's a small thing, but it's just less but more quality is kind of the way to go for me. Less is more, baby. Something. Less is more. It's going to say something on that. Less but better is actually <laughs> my more enjoyed twist on that. Less but better. Mm. Less but better. Yeah. I think that I had something. That's probably it. It's probably okay. <laughs> if, I, if I wasn't that boring. Something about paper and pads. <laughs> Makes me think of that Scissors. Tim Ferriss, Neil Gaiman episode. Gaiman. I never know how to say his last name, but Gaiman. they talked about fountain pens for at least 45 yeah. minutes. That was a good one. That so we're not going to do that. We're going to end things here. I guess we're going to land it. I thought I had something. But it's cruise on him. Maybe next week. Maybe next week. We'll see you then. Thank you, fun. everyone, for tuning in with us today. Thanks for being here along the ups and downs, the highs, the lows, being here with us in the trenches. If you like this show maybe you don't like this episode but if you like other episodes <laughs> i would please go give us a review on spotify apple podcasts really helps us out you can subscribe to the dare to dream youtube channel on youtube it's thank you so much this episode love y'all yeah do truly truly <laughs>